Wow. Um, it was cold this morning, 20 degrees, and Bill and Robert were up in Silver Falls, and we were hiking in the ice and snow, and it was beautiful. I know, right? I found out that Robert's quite the agility man. He can deal with ice. He just kind of moves with it, you know? <laughs> He just said, hey, no problem. He's just running past us, and Bill and I are going, wait a minute. This is slippery. But we made our way. We blow the shofar underneath the falls. We praise God's name and said hallelujah as loud as we could. And it was a glorious morning. Every now and then, it's important, as we know in Colossians, Colossians tells us this. We are to sing songs, spiritual hymns, and to give witness and to pray for one another. Why? To strengthen one another. And we're told to give testimony. And testimony is a way of encouraging and strengthening all of us. And when I heard Robert's testimony, he was starting to share it with me a, a few weeks ago. And I went, man, Robert, I really need you to share that with the congregation because that's really big. And he said, yes. So um, just if, if you don't know Robert yet, you should. He's a really nice guy. I got to know him. He he's, loves danger. Um, <laughs> He climbs up trees. He cuts. You, you, you ever seen those trees that are cut off at 150 feet? That's, that's him. He puts the little spike shoes on and, you know, goes up there and the tree's going like this. And he goes, timber. Yeah, that's Robert. I, I told him this morning, I said, you're nuts. You're just nuts. He has a beautiful wife, Ephra. Is that right? Ephra. So can you guys welcome Robert and Ephra? Robert, come on up. <laughs> so take it away, man. Thank you, sir. I made sure I didn't drink too much coffee today because coffee can get in the way. Do you, have you ever had coffee prayers, right? We're like, oh, thank you, Abba, you're the best, and I just pray for this person. I just, you're the, you know, all glory to you. I don't want to be up here doing that. I want to make sure that every word that I speak, this is just my own notes. Right here, yeah. Yeah, how do I use this? Just the green button, or oh, the side button? Oh, I see. Okay. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. My family, my mishpucha. <clears throat> it's been a very powerful Shabbat so far already. Um, you know, sometimes when we're together, we're full of joy. How much time do I have? What's Five to three, so like 20 minutes. Okay. I've got a three-minute testimony version uh, for hitchhikers on Kauai, and I've got a 10-minute and a 15-minute. But um, uh, it's, we wake up every day in these bodies, and we don't always feel joyful, right? Sometimes we speak to our partners or our coworkers or even ourselves, even to Elohim sometimes, um, and it's not loving, it's not in truth, and that can put us in a place very quickly where we're like, oh, Abba can never use me again. He can, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go to Shabbat, you know, and have joy, right? Uh, and then you get to Shabbat, you have joy, and then you find out people are sick, People are in bondage. People are afraid. People are not sure of what's coming down the road. And so we all gather around and we pray for everybody, right? And it's like, wow, this is a somber moment. Is, you know, am I going to be able to stand up and share the joy that I have after knowing that people are in bondage and they're sick and stuff like that? But the joy that I have, I've striven for. Abba has done a great work in me to, prov to make this happen. And I'm looking forward to sharing real quick what uh how that happened so anyway shabbat shalom we got a couple awesome pictures up there um i'm a big advocate for facebook not for the social media god but for connecting with the body of israel all over the world 
And so I say Shabbat Shalom to you. I have great joy. But trust me, I don't wake up in joy. Right? My wife knows very well. Like, I'm not always joyful. But when I am with my family, I am usually quite joyful. Okay. Let's see. So I'm going to share with you how Abba woke me up. What he did to call this wayward son into his kingdom. But the real message which you can only get from getting to know each other is how we remain within the house of Israel. We remain with the son, with the father in truth. So everything that I'm going to share with you today is not to glorify myself. It's not to glorify this body or my wife's love for me. It's to glorify my father who is in heaven, who is, who is awesome, and to glorify his son who he drew me to, so that I can come back to him, the father, and give him praises. And then also, just going to make sure, uh, to glorify truth, right, because it's not me, it's not this, it's not my job, it's nothing in this world except the truth, and all levels of the truth, and all the knowledge of the truth, and all the love of the truth. And then also a testimony of his power, that's the biggest thing, right, because where he took me from, what I was, it was only by the tangible, physical power of the creator himself, the angels, the spirit, however it works, that actually was able to open my eyes. Now, not everybody gets an experience like that, but I needed it because I was blind as a bat. Quick disclaimer, I use the name Yahuwah and Yahusha and Elohim, and I very rarely use the word God, but I don't mind those things. Anybody can use Yeshua, Yahweh, God, Lord, it doesn't bother me, but I call on Yahuwah and Yahusha, just so you know. Okay, so here we go. So my life was pretty much just a normal American life. Um, we had family dinners at the dinner table. Uh, grew up, cable TV, um, did the normal American holidays, um, had video games, went to public education. Didn't really get disciplined or anything like that growing up. Um, I got tucked in at night. Every night I'd get ready for bed and my mom would come up and then it, when I moved in with my dad, my dad would come up and they would just tell you, love you, have a good night, you know, all those wonderful things. Um, I don't know if, I, I was molested a couple times. I don't know if I can say that up here. Now, not to diminish it, but it was slight. Not by my mom and dad, just so you know. Um, now, there has been some very bad molestation within the house of Israel, we know this, but it just to kind of direct you in how Abba used me to make me who I was, right? Um, smoked some cannabis growing up, you know, nothing big. I wasn't really what you might call a stoner, probably until I was an adult when I got out of the Navy, but just grade school, just smoked some cannabis. Pretty normal kid, did some school, talked back to my parents, uh, just like any, I think, kids do. I don't know, do kids talk back still? Do the, children, do the House of Israel children, do they talk back to their parents? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, just, I was basically just a normal, weird, Americanized kid, right? There was just nothing, nothing super strange. We uh, usually sit, did the Catholic prayer at dinner time, which was like the sign of the, you know, the cross. And, you know, I don't remember what the prayer was, but it was, you know, there was no talk of creation and spirituality and anything outside of that. It was all just, you know very routine, went to Sunday church, and I sat there, I hated every single minute of it. I don't know if the children, if you guys like coming to these assemblies where there's joy and spirit and truth, I'm not sure if that's cool or not for you guys, but, um, and so yeah, and then there's uh, uh, just continued growing up like that, right? So when I joined the Navy, I first went to college and then found like, I don't wanna do that. I wanna be a Navy SEAL. That's what I want to do. I don't want to study trees and walk through the forest. I want to kill evil, wicked men, right? So you know how like a lot of people will grow up saying, well, I was born homosexual. Like that's all I've known, right? Well, I was born a killer. Okay, I know that sounds crazy. So it's like I can't follow the homosexuality being born that way because I was born a killer way, right? But Abba changed that, right? Because for whatever reason. Um, so what I did was I joined the Navy, sorry, trying to get a hold of this. Um, so I joined the Navy and um, Navy was pretty normal. 
women, drinking, um, and then training. So I was a, my last tour of duty, I was a special operations free fall parachutist, okay? So that means I basically would run and gun and train with the frogmen, army special ops. I was jumping out of planes, shooting guns, rappelling out of helicopters, doing some really great hikes, you know? Um, but before I even got to that point, I was just working different Navy jobs. I was an instructor, I was a teacher. Um, I worked on airplanes, right? But the last job that I had, I was an instructor and I taught men how to jump out of airplanes, pilots, air crewmen, and then to survive if they landed in the ocean. Well, I had a chief who worked there, a boss, and he was a Christian, right? And I always knew that there was something different about this dude. And so I basically linked up with him and I said, you know, what's, what's your deal? Who are you? What's the, you know, what's, what's up? And he kind of took me under his wing as like a, like a father, you know, took me to Christian Sunday church a bunch of times. And I thought it was cool. You know, I was like, this was nice. You know, I didn't really have any idea what we were studying in Bible study. I didn't understand. And basically everything that happened was just going right over my consciousness. I wasn't aware of any of it. All I knew is this dude took me in and he gave me some meals, you know, and hooked me up with his family. Um, I got orders to go to the special operations community. And when I did that, he said, Robert, before you go, I want you to know that those guys, they work hard and they play hard or they work hard, they play harder. So just be careful. I'm like, oh, I got it. Like, yeah, I'm good to go. I'm Christian, right? Like having no idea, never been baptized, none of that, right? So I go to, oh, that's why I have a guide. I have to go back real quick, okay? All right. Okay, so let no one deceive you of the prize. One who takes delight in false humility and worship of angels, taking his stand on visions puffed up in his fleshly mind. So I'm going to tell you a quick story. Before I left that command to go to special operations, I was laying in my barracks room one night and I woke up and I was paralyzed. I couldn't move a muscle. And I basically, I realized that there was something standing at the edge of my bed, okay, at the foot of my bed. And it was glowing, all right, had a gown on, couldn't really identify, but basically I was terrified, right? This thing, this being standing at the edge of my bed. And then it took me out of my body, I guess, because it put me behind the eyes of a female who was standing in a kitchen and there was a bunch of guys around and there was alcohol bottles all around and she was very terrified. Terrified. I could feel her fear as though I was her. Then, next thing you know, I'm back in my uh, barracks room, laying in my bed, and the, and the angel, the being, was no longer standing at the foot of my bed. It was standing directly next to me, okay? And it turned my head to the side to look at it, and it said three words to me. It said, you will see. And for years, I basically wrote that experience off, just some religious experience. I figured it was a Virgin Mary from Catholicism. I didn't know the difference. And then when I was an atheist, I just imagined that it was some alien came to give me a message <laughs> and I didn't know the difference. That's what it was. So before, so basically, I go to this new community and I get into this community and everybody's an atheist, right? Nobody's a Christian, nobody's a Jew, nobody's nothing, right? Everybody is just atheism. So I don't know if it was a tribal thing or a whatever thing, but basically I latched on very quickly to this atheism. I read a couple books, well, truth, I perused a couple atheistic books. I was watching dirty atheism documentaries on Netflix, right? And this was probably 12, 14 years ago. And so very quickly, I latched on to atheism, right? When I was learning about this atheism, it took me a while to even, um, to even utter with my lips, I don't think that there is a God, right? But once I spoke those words, I remember feeling a change within myself, right? And so with me, Abba has created me to kind of always advance, you know, like amongst my peers, I would just kind of climb faster and higher, right? That's why I'm up in these crazy trees wondering, Abba, what the heck am I doing up here, right? This is terrifying. Um, but when I'm with this community and these guys, you know, they would 
we would talk about Christianity and how it's stupid and the lies was or were um, that basically the government is corrupt because of Christianity and it was only a matter of time before the government said Christians can just do another crusade before they start killing all the atheists right that's that's what the enemy was putting in my head so me taking this thing to the next level which is what I always did um, I was like yeah like they should be killed they should be removed from the earth like yeah but then now the eighth now I'm weird to the atheists <laughs> right because they're like they don't want to go there right but I did um, so one of my friends while I was in the Navy he had this thing called synthetic cannabinoid right it's like a synthetic THC one of the common street names at the time was like K2 or spice I'm sure some of those things right and I had tried all these different versions of this stuff and all the different kinds of highs the DEA would legalize one or uh, illegalize they'd come up with a whole nother one but anyways I was smoking this stuff all the time when I was off duty. And when I was off duty, I was studying books about how to kill. I was learning from the Navy SEALs how to kill. I was uh, watching movies about assassins killing, right? But when I would use this chemical at the end of the day, at the end of my shift, it would put me into this world where this fantasy where I was there, right? And because I began to have a, this darkness within me, this hate for Christianity, because the, you know, they're the reason and the problem for everything, um, I would be on this chemical in this fantasy world and it would release the same chemicals that you would experience going out on actual ops, right? So like adrenaline, serotonin, dopamine, fear, right? So I was, in a way, the enemy was training me to overcome going on these real missions, right? That men in this day are training up, going on for one day when Gog and Magog are going to come at us, right? But anyway... So I'm laying there and I would be in these fantasy worlds for 15 minutes going into Christians' houses, shooting them in their beds, cutting them up in blood and guts and you name it, right? This was in me. Now what messed with me is that I had dinner parties. You know what I'm saying? Like I called my friends, I checked up on people. Like I loved my family, you know, but there was still this darkness in this atheist, this hate that was welling up in me. And what's interesting about being an atheist is there was many nights I remember finishing up this drug. Oh, by the way, my roommate who was on deployment for like four years or something, I basically stewarded his three bedroom house, huge yard, huge field. So on this chemical, I would be going out training by myself in the dark on this chemical to do these these crazy gnarly things to innocent people right um, okay so I woke up one day and I was like wow everybody's brainwashed coming from the guy who you know <laughs> and I said man so I got to do is like I got to get out of here something's crazy right so what I did was I put an early request shit to get out. I only got like eight minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, so I got out of the Navy and uh, before I had a month off for overtime pay. So before I got off, I spent a month watching uh, end time events, disasters, preppers, things like that. And the father was starting to work with me, showing me things uh, before I even got there to his presence. Uh, secret societies, government conspiracies, um, Egyptian pictures like hieroglyphs and things like that like they're weird if you I don't know Jonathan Kleck I don't know if that name rings a bell you turn them upside down you invert them it's like children eating demons and demons eating children and super gnarly stuff uh, right you know <laughs> um, and so what happens when so I get out of the Navy I go to Kauai because I didn't want to stay in Washington because FEMA camp Kauai sounded a lot better than FEMA camp you know Washington State you know it was cold I don't like the cold so we get there I'm there for about a month and a half two months having dinner parties um, loving my friends I don't hate the government anymore and they're like I'm, now I'm skipping stuff because I want to make sure we have the timeline here and I get to the good stuff um, but I woke up really early one morning my mother came for a visit your average Sunday Christian and you know she's been a Sunday Christian longer than I've even been in this so pray for her you know that Abba will open her eyes to her son's word um, 
his son's word. Um, and so I wake up really early. I go out. She's reading her daily devotional, reading from her Bible. And I had her read it to me. Didn't make any sense. Went right over my head. And I said, I saw this thing on a prophecy video that talked about the Pleiades, which is um, in the book of Job. And can I see your Bible to see if I can find it? And she said, yeah. So I open the Bible. I turn one page and my eyes connected directly with the word Pleiades, right? In the book of Job. It was super cool. Like the first little miracle, right? I read it, didn't make any sense. I basically grabbed a cigarette, went outside, and she met me in the kitchen, and she said, um, she said, uh, Robert, um, she said, there was a guy in the Bible named Paul who used to persecute and kill God's people. And God came to him, forgave him, and used him in a huge way. And I said, ah, okay, you know, I started to feel tingly at that point, right? Because my mother had known who I was, I always shared with her. But as a mom, like, how do you hear that? You know, I want to murder Christians, right? Right. And so I go out into the garage and then he got me. And it just reminded me when I first walked in here, this sweet beloved sister, she goes, oh, how did you come to know Yahuwah? And so now you get to know the full story to a degree. Um, so I walked out of the garage and then boom, like from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet was filled with the presence of the almighty God. Right. Like, and when it's Abba, you know, it's the creator. Like there's no denying it. Satan can't counterfeit it. Drugs can't counterfeit it. Nothing can counterfeit. So I knew that this was the most high and I couldn't move. I was frozen. Like my skin felt like it was floating off my body. My spine was just vibrating and it felt like a finger was pushing into the back of my head right now we know that there's a little bit of information about the pineal gland with the spine connecting to the brain that area i don't know if there was an angel i don't know what it was but it was hot it was burning but it felt good like this whole experience was pleasure right in a good way and while that was going on, there was these tubes of light that I remember I could see it, but it was behind me. And I don't know if it was washing all of my science, all of my hate, all of my whatever out of my mind. I don't know. But while that was going on, I heard a voice within me say five things or four or five things. God is real. Jesus has something to do with it. I had to get a Bible. I had to tell everybody that Jesus was alive because I was telling everybody that he was just a Freemason. They wanted to create this religion. You know, it's like he's a dead man, you know. And so and then I had to and then also that there was a huge difference between religion and the truth. And at that point, I didn't know what that meant, you know. And so while that was so that ended and then all of a sudden, right before my very eyes, face level, maybe four feet away, I saw a dude hanging on a cross. Now, whether it was a stake or a cross, you know, who cares? I saw a dude who was butchered in front of me, right? This dude was bloody and shredded up, okay? And I knew that this was Jesus from the Catholic, from the Christian time, you know? And I knew that if I accepted this thing, now I didn't understand what it was, but I knew that this was forgiveness. I, that's all I knew. And I knew that if I accepted this thing, that I would be forgiven and that I would be used in a huge way. But that's not why he came, right? So I didn't come into this covenant because I was distraught. I didn't come in because I was sad, because I was alone, right? I came in because I wanted truth, right? As an atheist, I wanted to know where molecules came from. I wanted to know where the galaxies and the stars and the cosmos and dirt and air and us came from, right? And I've been, I've come to learn a lot of these things and more. Um, so that's why I believe he came to me. So I knew at this moment, this is truth. If I accept this forgiveness, he's going to give me truth and everything that I've ever desired to know. And I said, I inside, I said, okay, I accept it, right? Boom, instantly, all the electricity, all the him, everything was gone the very moment I accepted it, right? And then now I'm standing there 30 seconds later in love with God, right? I had no idea who it was or which God it was. I just knew God is real. Jesus has something to do with it. And I had to get a Bible. I had to tell everybody that Jesus was alive and that there was a huge difference between religion and truth. And that was just the entering in. Now, as we're going to get to know each other, and I'm going to share some stories with you um, about how I've remained in him this covenant because i'll tell you what the enemy does not like what's going on in us but he attacks us so i don't even know where i'm at but i shared that slide because i don't like being up here i don't like attention um but uh but it's about remaining in him and making choices so 
This next verse up here is, And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. And that's Exodus 6, 5. So he brought me into the covenant. He saved my soul. I was born again, right? But in the process, I've had to make choice after choice after choice. Am I going to remain in him? Am I going to believe his promises as those promises increase in the knowledge of what he actually said? Am I going to believe it, right? And I've had to claw my way. I shared the analogy this morning of how Abba hasn't drugged me, you know, to keep me in, but I've hung on to his garment as he drugged me because I didn't want to let go of him, right? And so we're groaning here and if you notice where is it that word remember is highlighted so some of the meanings of that word it's, it's it's to mark to mention or to burn as incense mindful remember think on so when i see us and i see the children of israel in bondage and i see our people suffering bondage it reminds me that we're giving off an aroma to Abba. And he's going to remember the covenant that he made with us. Look at our people scattered in exile for the last however many years. We've had it pretty good. We haven't really been groaning. You know, there's been some groanings, but not like it is now. So Abba's moving very quickly in our lives because we're giving, we're groaning and, and we're giving off an aroma that is sweet to him. I almost burped into the microphone. Sorry about that. I'm learning how to do this. Say, therefore, to the children of Israel, I am Yahuwah, and I shall bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I shall deliver you from their enslavings, and shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments, and shall take you as my people, and I shall be your Elohim. And you shall know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who is bringing you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians." Taxes, mandates, licenses, fake food, false religions, inflations, wicked government, unbelieving family, etc., etc., etc. We're in bondage. We have burdens. We have fears. We have doubts, right? We say amen or amen at the end of the prayers. We surrounded our sister and we prayed, and at the end we all said amen. In Hebrew, palal means to turn your face, turn your being, turn your woes, turn your fears all towards Yahuwah Elohim. And then we say amen at the end because we say we send it in faith. It's done, right? So that way we can have a, a somber meeting and then sing praises and then jump for joy right because we sent it up we're good but we have to make that choice when I climb 150 feet up in a tree it's terrifying my brothers know we pray about the fear that's in me but I have to make a choice to keep moving forward every single day every single moment and Moshe spoke thus to the children of Israel but they did not listen to Moshe because of the shortness of spirit from hard slavery we come here every single Shabbat when we can. More are coming. Some are leaving, right? Do we hear the messages from each other, from our brothers, from the spirit, from the word of Elohim, the promises telling us to endure, to be ready, to not fear, to trust in him? Can we hear even though the bondage is increasing? I'm trying. I'm trying, but there's a lot that can't. And so as he increases us, he's giving us the ability to speak truth to them in a big way, in a big way. Yahuwah is near to the brokenhearted and saves those whose spirit is crushed. The slaughterings of Elohim are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. O Elohim, these you do not despise. The bondage is supposed to do these things to us. It's supposed to squeeze us like oil, like an olive. Because when it does, and we don't crumble, then it gives off an aroma to the Father. And he will remember the covenant that he made with his children, the house of Israel. And one day we're not going to talk about how Abba freed us from Egypt. One day we're going to say how Abba freed all the house of Israel from all the four corners of the world. Hallelujah.
And trust me, I mean, I'm not like, I'm all joyful, you know, and I'm all happy on Shabbat. Like I have hard times too. You know, I don't wake up super happy. Don't ask my wife about this, the stories, you know what I'm saying? And even on Shabbat, sometimes on Shabbat, you know, we go into this day and something happens, something comes up and we're like, oh, I can't have joy now. No, I can't praise Abba now. Oh, I can't pray now. It's like, no, yeah, you can just be chill. Come back to the body. Come back to the body of Yisrael. When I came here, now I'm just, now I'm just owning it. Um, <laughs> when I moved here from Kauai, I spent five minutes the first time in this assembly and I knew that this is the house of Israel. Geographically, Abba places his name where he wants his people to be. And this is where he's placed his name. So more are going to be coming. So prepare. But me and my house, we're going to serve Yahuwah Elohim. And we're going to believe in his promises even when it gets hard. Amen. So endure, 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 and you will be saved if you endure. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Wow.